meeting underway. All right. Hi, everybody. I hope y'all had a great Memorial Day weekend. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker. Dr. Gleb was lauded as office whisperer and hybrid expert by the New York Times for helping leaders use hybrid work to improve attention and productivity while cutting costs. He serves as the CEO of the Future of Work consulting firm, Disaster Avoidance Experts. Dr. Gleb wrote seven best-selling books, including Returning to the Office and Leading Hybrid and Remote Teams. It's the first book on returning to the office and leading hybrid teams since the pandemic. He published over 650 articles in prominent venues such as Harvard Business Review, Forbes, and Fortune. His cutting edge thought leadership was translated into Chinese, German, Russian, Korean, Polish, Spanish, Vietnamese, French, and other languages. Dr. Gleb's expertise comes from over 20 years of consulting and training. His clients include Fortune 500 companies ranging from Aflac to Xerox. His expertise also comes from his academic background as a behavioral scientist. Dr. Gleb <clears throat> taught for eight years as a lecturer at UNC Chapel Hill and seven years as a professor at Ohio State. Go Buckeyes. Dr. Gleb is a proud Ukrainian American and lives in Columbus, Ohio. In his free time, he spends abundant quality time with his wife to avoid his personal life turning into maybe a disaster if he were not there. So to help us take advantage of his groundbreaking expertise, I've asked him to share with us about using hybrid work to improve retention and productivity while cutting costs for HR professionals. Now please give a big round of virtual applause to welcome Dr. Gleb. <laughs> thank you so much for that kind introduction. I really appreciate it. And thank you all for coming to check out how to use hybrid work to improve retention and productivity while cutting costs. So that's the key. You as HR professionals, so I've helped 24 companies by now transition to hybrid work and I've mainly worked with HR organizations as part of the company to do that. And what I find is that HR professionals tend to be kind of stuck in the middle between the leadership team, top leaders, and the workers. That workers tend to have more of a desire for flexibility. Leadership has more of a desire for workers to spend time in the office, and HR kind of gets caught in the middle mediating the situation. Fortunately, it doesn't have to be just a situation of butting heads. You can use data, you can use evidence to create a win-win-win situation for everyone. But to do that, you need to know the data. What is the data? What actually does the research say? You need to know the kind of mistakes that leaders and employees tend to make around hybrid work. And you need to know the best practices in hybrid work activities that will help you improve retention of your employees and their productivity while also cutting costs. And of course, retention and productivity improvement will also help cut costs. So that's how the presentation will be structured. I'll talk first about the data. What does the research and hybrid work show? Then I will talk about the kind of mistakes that many leaders tend to make and their followers when thinking about hybrid work. And finally, I will focus on what are the actual best practices in hybrid work activities. So that's what we'll be talking about. Let's kick off. Now, you've probably heard your leadership say that people are our greatest resource. People are our greatest resource. It's a very common phrase, very widely used, but unfortunately, many leaders fail to live by that principle. And I say this as someone who helped 24 companies transition to return to the office, figuring out their hybrid work and talking to the, their leadership teams about this, that it's if their followers, if their employees see this contradiction between statement that people are our greatest resource, but the company's policies and is not in line with the rhetoric that causes you significant retention problems, productivity problems, disengagement problems. Many leaders just tend to be very comfortable with traditional office culture. That's what they like. That's what they are used to. And so they want to turn back the clock and deny the reality of the major disruption caused by the pandemic. That's a problem when they're denying that reality, when there's a disjunction 
between what the workers actually see and what they experience in their daily life and daily work and what they hear from the leadership team and the kind of policy that the company promotes that tends to be a big, big problem. So let's think about how to think best about hybrid work. Leaders tend to see it as a loss, as a problem, something to be avoided, giving flexibility. Many of them want their employees to be in the office as much as possible. Instead, what I help encourage HR folks to help their leadership team see is that it's a major opportunity to maximize productivity and retention. Productivity and retention, and therefore cut costs. But to do so, you need to put aside default assumptions, habits, and preferences. Our intuitions are not going to be a very good guide to hybrid work and remote work because leaders, they matured and they succeeded through in-office work. So their intuitions are not a good fit for the modern world of flexibility. And we need to focus on business objectives and outcomes instead of what's personally comfortable for us. To overcome the errors we tend to make, these are decision-making errors called cognitive biases, the human factors that cause bad decisions in the future of work and integrate best practices on innovative work arrangements. So that's what we'll be talking about. That is the shape of the presentation. And let's get at the data first. So there are eight major independent surveys that I want to share with you about from organizations like the Harvard Business School, like the Society for Human Resource Management, which we're all a part of, which don't have a stake in the outcome. And so they researched hybrid work preferences, employees, and so on. And they found that 75 to 85% of workers don't want traditional office-centric work. And these are, of course, we're talking only about remote capable employees, that we're not talking about those on the front lines like factory workers, people who can, but back office workers, people who can do remote capable activities actually really want to do it. For example, just to give you a specific survey, a McKinsey survey, again, no stake in the outcome, they serve whatever needs corporations have. They found that 87% of remote capable workers would take at least some remote work if they're given that flexibility. So they wouldn't want just in-office work, traditional Monday through Friday, nine to five. 25 to 35% want full-time remote work. As an example, LinkedIn found that 15% of their applications are for fully remote work, but those 15% of applications get over 50%. So they have one five percent of applications are for remote work, but they get over five zero percent of all interest in all applications on LinkedIn. 40 to 55% would leave their job if forced to come in full-time. And over 70% are less likely to leave if offered substantial remote work, meaning over half the work. This is very hardcore, very clear data on retention and recruitment as part of that, of course. Now, let's talk about productivity. We know from extensive research that remote employees are actually more productive, not less productive on average. So when someone does a task remotely, compared to them doing the same task in the office, so let's say for a hybrid team, an in-office day versus a remote day doing the same activity, people who are remote will be more productive. We know this from surveys. So for 55% report higher productivity, 15% lower, and 30% the same. But not only surveys, we also know this from employee monitoring software, the Protoscore and so on find that remote staff are over 5% more productive when they're working remotely compared to when they're working in the office. And there was a specific study by Stanford University, which found that in May 2020, remote workers were an average 5% more productive. But in two years later, the same study we run over found that remote workers were 9% more productive. So productivity improved actually for remote workers because we learned how to work together in the remote settings better, learned how to collaborate better, leaders learned how to lead better, Companies invested into technology, into home offices, their workers invested into home offices, utilities made internet faster, government invested into it. So there's a lot of reasons why remote work became more productive over the span of the pandemic. And it has continued with increasing improvements in the remote work technology. It has, of course, continued to improve now. It's May 2023. So I'm sure that productivity number would be even higher. Remote hybrid employees have better well-being, no question about it. There's definitely some challenges in social isolation, but overall, the benefits of not commuting are very high. The commute is the most stressful part of our day. People have very big challenges emotionally, 
for psychologically, physically when commuting. So overall, the cost of commuting outweighs the problems of social isolation. Over 75% feel less stressed when they have substantial remote work. 70% report better well-being and 75% report feeling happier. Now, given this information and your own experience, I'm going to ask you, what, uh, which of these is your own preference on work? So look at the screen. You should see a survey on the screen for a poll. Please go ahead and vote. Which is your preference? Fully remote, one day in the office, two days in the office, three days in the office, four days in the office, or full time, five days in the office? Go ahead. Okay, I think the large majority of us voted. Let's give five more seconds for those who have made their, made their voice heard. Five more seconds. Okay, so we see that no one here would actually want five days in the office. And we have the majority want less than half the week in the office, which is what I tend to find when serving HR staff. And we have something like over a third want three days in the office, a quarter want two days in the office, under 10% want four days in the office, another under 10% want oh, one day in the office and another quarter want fully remote. Okay, good. So we see it's generally fitting within the survey results that, that we see have been reported elsewhere. Great. Okay, let's talk about the typical errors that leaders tend to make when they're thinking about and approaching remote work. These are called decision-making cognitive biases. So cognitive bias is a decision-making error. You've probably heard of the term cognitive bias. Our minds, unfortunately, aren't evolved for the modern environment. They are evolved for the ancient savanna environment when we lived in small tribes of 50 people to 150 people. That's what we are evolved for. That's what our intuitions tell us is the right place. It's kind of the fight or flight response. You might have heard of it as a saber to tiger response. It was better to jump at a hundred shadows than to miss one saber to tiger. And so these are the consequences in our modern world of those ancient intuitions that cause us to make bad decisions. And one of the biggest is called the status quo bias. The status quo bias is a desire to maintain or get back the status quo with which we feel comfortable just because we feel comfortable with it, regardless of whether it's the best thing for us. In the ancient spread environment, any change was dangerous because our lives were so precarious. So it's understandable that in that environment, it was a good thing to get back to the status quo because there wasn't going to be any major broader disruption. It was just going to be a change of the seasons, spring, summer, fall, winter, that's all. So it's good to get back to the status quo, whatever it was. It's good to maintain traditions. In the modern environment, we have many more disruptions and changes. I mean, right now, disruptions caused by AI, disruptions caused by remote work, disruptions caused by the pandemic, by the rise of the smartphone, by the 2008-2009 fiscal crisis, and so on. All of these are disruptions that change the way we work and require us to do things differently. But it's very hard for us to do so and to adapt to it. So there's a desire to downplay major disruption from the pandemic. And that's understandable when leaders have the status quo bias toward what they're comfortable with in the office. That's what they know. That's what they feel is the right thing. And so they want to get back to what they know and what they feel to be the right thing. And so that's a very dangerous dynamic. The status quo bias causes leaders to make bad decisions about flexibility. Another problem is called the empathy gap. The empathy gap. That kind of has to do with our tribalism, where in the ancient Savannah environment, it was important for us to align with those who are part of our tribe and not align, be kind of hostile toward those who aren't. So leaders feel that those who are in their tribe, in their in-group, are those who want to come to the office. And so they underestimate the emotions, the importance of the emotions in the 
of those people who don't want to come to the office. They think that those people are just you know, lazy or something like that. They don't understand the reality of their life circumstances and their strong desire for work-life balance, for well-being, to not come. Some of many of them have elder care responsibilities, have child care responsibilities. That's a very strong driver. And these desires for flexibility and well-being after the pandemic are very powerful. And that's the empathy gap. And the final one I wanted to tell you about is functional fixedness. Functional fixedness. When we learn one way of functioning, we tend to stick to it. In the spread environment, that was very good. When we learned one way of functioning, it was likely to be the right one because our context didn't change. Remember, we didn't have all these disruptions. In the modern world, what things that used to be functional become dysfunctional when the context changes. For example, when we transpose office-based culture and hybrid work and remote work, that's what happened in May to, in March 2020. There was all of this transposition, shoehorning of hybrid work and remote work into office-based culture and making some bad choices about hybrid work and remote work. And so as a result, many leaders feel that, well, remote work or hybrid work doesn't work well, so let's get our people into the office as much as possible because they fail to adapt strategically to innovate anywhere and collaborate everywhere. Now, thinking about these problems, which of these do you think might be the biggest problem in your organization? Let's vote on that. Please go ahead. Oh, um, the confirmation bias should be the empathy cap. Sorry about that. So again, the confirmation bias should be the empathy cap. Five more seconds, make your voice heard. Okay, so is his status quo bias followed by functional fixedness? About the same score, a little bit more for the status quo bias and a little bit less for functional fixedness. Definitely serious problems. So now that you know about these, it's an opportunity to take them back to your leadership team, to your, well, first of all, to your HR colleagues, and then to your leadership team and talk about these problems and how to address them. Okay, let's talk about some best practices for the future. One, thing to think about is that the best approach to hybrid work is, like extensive research has shown, is a flexible team-led model. Instead of having the leadership team determine Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday, for example, everyone comes in and uh, free, those three days a week, a much, much better approach is to leave it up to team leaders and their teams to decide together on what works best for each team because you want to push decision-making down, you want to decentralize it, then you'll have buy-in from each team member because they weigh in on the decision and they know best what is needed for each team. For example, sales teams, I tend to find, want to come into the office more often than programmer teams. So it depends on which team comes to the office and what they do, then you will see that dynamic. So you really want to differentiate that and have a team-led model with the majority of the people being hybrid first and maybe a minority fully remote. Hybrid employees are going to come to the office one to two days a week, this is gonna be the majority. Generally speaking, you don't need more than one day in the office for people to get the benefit of collaboration, which is the best thing to do in the office. And fully remote employees are going to be a minority, 10 to 30%, depending on how much tech talent you usually have, because those are the people who really press for fully remote work, and those are people who can most afford to switch jobs if they're not getting fully remote work. And you want to adopt best practices for hybrid and remote work arrangements. Now, you want to provide training on effective hybrid work, what to do at home and what to focus on in the office. When we look at this question, it's, it's very, very clear what are the best activities to do at home. So doing at home, the best activities are your individual head down work, whether it's programming, whether it's research, whether it's writing reports, doing graphic design, marketing design, creating PowerPoints, all, all of this sort of stuff, writing content, individual work, much better done at home. 
then emails and Slack messages and Microsoft team messages, much, much better done at home. These and other forms of asynchronous communication. There's no reason you need to come to the office and write emails. And finally, video conference meetings and phone calls. Overwhelmingly, they're better done at home where you're not distracting everyone else in the cubicles or open office around you, and they're not distracting you. So that those are activities that are much better done at home, and those activities represent 85 to 90 percent of the workday of any employee, on average. Some people more, some people less. What to focus on in the office? In the best things to focus on in the office are those that require intense contact with other people. That means more tense forms of synchronous collaboration. So where you want to see other people, not just the daily, not just kind of the weekly check-in meeting, but all of that can certainly be done in the office, but more intense forms of collaboration where you actually need to make some decisions. Those are better done in the office. Now that intense engagement. Then nuanced conversations where you need to convey body language and so on with as many tonalities as possible. Performance evaluation conversations, conversations about conflicts, meetings with clients definitely are better done in person. Although many clients nowadays certainly prefer to do remote meetings. So if you need to do that, do that. But if you can meet with clients in the office, meet with them in the office, then you also have social, the other, other category of activities that you need to do in the office better are socializing and team bonding, definitely better done in the office for obvious reasons. And finally, mentoring and on the job training, definitely better done in the office. Mentoring and on the job training are activities that are good fit in the, for the office. And those are activities that take up 10 to 15% of most workers' activities. Again, some people will be less, some people will be closer to 5% if you're an individual contributor, like a programmer or an accountant. Some people will be closer to 25, 30, 35 if you're a salesperson has a lot of meetings and so on with clients. So it depends on your situation. But then that's why I say you need to leave it up to each individual team. And so train people on what they should do, focus on at home and what to focus on in the office. And you want to train them on effective virtual communication and collaboration. So those are really important activities on which you want to train people. Those are key things. So make sure to do that. Now, I want uh, to, well, so let's talk about next, about how do you do collaboration more virtually? So solving collaboration and team building. That's certainly, it's good to do that in the office, but you need to do that some of the time virtually as well, right? For hybrid teams, sometimes fully remote teams, a very good way to do so is not, is to form an activity called virtual coworking which replaces in-person co-working, where you work next to each other in an open office or in cubicles. So what does virtual co-working entail? It work, entails working along team members on a video conference call. So it's for fully virtual teams or hybrid teams on non-office days. You sign into a one-hour video conference call, and you start by sharing the project on which you'll work. So Zoom video conference call, much like this one, you, you sign into it, six to eight people teams, your rank and file teams, and you share the project on which you'll work. This, these are individual activities. These are not meant to be collaborative activities. So you'll be working on your individual project. Then you turn off your microphone, you leave like you all did, so thank you for muting. You leave your speakers on, again, like you all did, thank you for doing that, and your video is off. Then, you work on things, but if you have a question or innovation ideas, you turn on your microphone and share. So I facilitated a number of these to get people used to it. And what I tend to see is that well, five minutes, 10 minutes goes by, then somebody has a question or an idea and they turn on their microphone and they share. And then there's a brief discussion where team members chime in, maybe do some screen sharing to share things. And then they finish up and stop and move on to doing their work. And then maybe another, 10 to 15 minutes, there's another activity. And you have discussion. So you have maybe three or four of these over an hour. You can answer questions, discuss ideas, and you turn on your microphones at the end and share what you accomplished. This is really a useful activity for helping teams bond. It facilitates their innovation and it integrates junior team members. So very, very effective activity. Now, at this point, I will share with you the experience of someone who integrated this team-led modality into their work. So this is Dr. Craig Knobloch, 
the executive director of the Information Sciences Institute, which is an AI research center at the University of Southern California. It has about 400 staff and you know how hot AI is right now. So this is him sharing about integrating this hybrid first team led model with virtual co-working and so on into his activity. Let's see what he has to say. Uh, Gleb Zabersky came, came to my attention sometime back during the pandemic when uh, I was planning to have our research institute uh, follow the standard path that all the big corporations are following. So Apple and Google were announcing plans to have people come back three days a week. So I thought that seems like a good plan. So we actually sent out a message said, okay, starting this date, everyone's coming back three days a week. Uh, and then, you know, can work from home two days a week. Uh, and, and then I saw a video that Gleb actually, a uh, video talk that Gleb actually gave for IEEE uh, that really actually changed my mind about this. And it was a video about hybrid work and how important it was to actually embrace it. And, uh, uh, and one of the things I was impressed in the video is that all these interesting ideas about how to make hybrid work more effective and stuff. So I signed up for a meeting with Gleb and uh, uh, learned quite a bit more about you know, how to do hybrid work well. And so Gleb has come on as a consultant for the Information Science Institute and has been really helpful in terms of putting us much more in a leadership position in terms of figuring out how to do hybrid work. So we changed our policies. We are much more flexible about who can work at home and, and allowing people to work from home, you know, whatever makes sense with respect to their supervisor, uh, creating spaces in people's home offices, uh, figuring out how to onboard people in a way that, you know, when people haven't met in person, that is more effective. Uh, so I think he's been incredibly helpful in terms of really transitioning us to be a, sort of a lead in, in how we manage hybrid work at the, at the Institute. So it's been incredibly useful with all of Club's advice, and I appreciate all the help he's given us with respect to moving forward with this, our hybrid work plans. Okay, so with this in mind, what do you think would be, how useful would the team-led approach be for your organization, for your workplace? Would it be not valuable, moderately valuable, or highly valuable? How valuable would it be? Please go ahead and vote. Okay, five more seconds to make your voice heard. Great, so we see that over a third of you would find it highly valuable and over half of you would find it moderately valuable. Excellent. So bring back whatever aspects of it for highly valuable, of course, you want to bring back all of it for moderately valuable, bring back whatever aspects of what you think would be valuable to you. Great. Now, let's talk about solving some more of the problems. So we talked about collaboration. Let's talk about solving another aspect of a problem I see. Burnout, proximity bias, and performance management. So proximity bias. Proximity bias combines worries by hybrid remote workers about their career advancement and envy by in-office workers for those who are hybrid and remote. So the, it affects both. It's about proximity. And the culture of excellence from anywhere is a good tool to solve the proximity bias because it helps you focus on outputs and deliverables, not inputs, not where you work. It helps address envy because it points out that it's not about location. It's about the outcomes that you're going for. This is what the focus is on. And it helps address burnout because the focus is on what you do, not how and where you do it. So the hybrid workers who are working remotely at the time don't have to worry about working past their hours if they don't want to. The focus is on their deliverables, not appearing busy. And it helps performance management with a focus on predetermined weekly goals. What does that mean? This is small scale frequent evaluations. The, this involves having weekly one-on-one -on -one meetings. Good managers, as I'm sure you as HR professionals know, already have weekly one-on-ones with their team members. Now, what is happening is bringing performance evaluation into it. So small scale performance evaluations at weekly one-on-ones. 
It helps team members always know where they stand and gives them psychological safety so when they know what their performance is, which improves retention and career growth, and of course cuts costs because of that. It prevents hybrid workers from overworking and burning out due to anxiety. This is a big, big cause of problems when they don't know where they stand, and this helps address that. What happens is that the team member and the supervisor agree on three to five weekly goals at their weekly one on one. So three to five weekly goals make them smart as much as possible, meaning specific, measurable, actionable, relevant, and timely. But if they have to be more qualitative than quantitative, so be it. So agree to three to five weekly goals, and anyone, any employee should be able to figure out three to five weekly goals for the week. Then the team member sends a supervisor report and goal. 24 hours before their next one-on-one. -on -one. So six days later, 24 hours before the next one-on-one, -on -one, they send their supervisory report on what they accomplished, their goals, or how they solved problems they encountered, and a self-evaluation. Then the one-on-one, -on -one, the team lead evaluates the performance of the team member, coaches them on solving problems better if needed, affirms the evaluation and revi or revises it, and it gets fed into a continuous promotion and evaluation system, and then you set goals for the next week. So this is a very, very effective continuous promotion and evaluation system that really helps team members have good decision-making and approach their hybrid work effectively. Now, I will share with you another video about another technique from Susan Winchester. She's the Chief Human Resources Officer at Applied Materials, which is a Fortune 200 high-tech manufacturer that has over 30,000 employees. So this is a manufacturing company in the semiconductor industry. And she's going to share about a technique that's real part of this hybrid first team-led model. Hi, I'm Susan Winchester, and it's my delight and pleasure to tell you a little bit about our experience with Dr. Gleb. He had a big positive impact at Applied Materials. Our leaders and engineers love data-based, research-based insights, which is exactly what he brings. He hit it out of the park. And he used a team-led process, which was incredibly engaging. He introduced us to a concept he created called asynchronous brainstorming. It was a process that we used with hundreds and hundreds of leaders globally at the same time. We did this during our CEO kickoff session for our strategy work. And in a very short amount of time, we were able to get great benefits. I also love the work he's doing to educate leaders around the power and positive benefits of hybrid and virtual working. And one of his techniques that I'm planning to use, because I think it's so cool, is what he calls virtual co-working where you and as many work coworkers, colleagues as you'd like, create a virtual meeting and no purpose or agenda, but rather just to be working with one another. So I highly endorse Dr. Gleb's work. Love him. Okay, so with this in mind, what are your thoughts about this excellence from anywhere approach? How useful would it be to integrate this technique into your work, how valuable, not valuable, moderately valuable, or highly valuable. Please go ahead and vote. Okay, see so most of you voted, five more seconds. Make your voice heard. Okay, so just under a third find it highly valuable and the rest would find it moderately valuable. Great to hear it. So again, highly valuable. If you want to take it back right now and try to integrate into your work and moderately valuable, see what aspects of it might be useful for you to take back and integrate. All right, everyone. So let's assess the key takeaways on this inflection on the future of work. So this is a key inflection. You want to think of it as a change, not as a loss, but as a disruption. That's an inflection on the future of work. You want to integrate addressing decision-making cognitive biases into your culture to optimize business outcomes on the future of work, despite potential personal discomfort for you, for business leaders, and you want to help them realize how to make good decisions in this area. Use a team-led hybrid first model 
with a minority fully removed. To retain best talent, improve productivity, maximize well-being and address burnout, which of course all helps cut costs. Adapt your culture to hybrid and remote by training an effective hybrid work and virtual communication collaboration. Integrate virtual co-working to have effective collaboration, team building and integration of junior staff. Remember, it's very helpful, especially for junior staff. And trust proximity bias, burnout and performance management through excellence from anywhere and weekly performance evaluations. Now it's up to you. Go out and make it happen. And I hope this presentation has been helpful. You'll get three additional resources, a copy of my best-selling book, Leading Hybrid and Remote Teams, and a free coaching session for the first three claimants. So there will be a poll. You don't need to fill out the, if you are watching this as a recording after the presentation, you can go to tinyurl.com forward slash DAE event to fill it out. So again, that's a, if you're watching this as a recording, go to tinyurl.com forward slash TAE event to fill it out. But otherwise, you'll just vote on a poll whether you want the resources. So let's go back and vote on a poll whether you want the resources. In the meantime, I'll be happy to take any questions. put your questions into the chat or you can unmute yourself whatever works for you chill you're very welcome i'm glad this was helpful i i did have a question um yeah. so what has been your experience like as far as like an implementation timeline for when you sort of start these practices to when you start seeing um, the return uh, as you implement along the lines? So it depends on the practice. So for example, with virtual co-working, you get immediate returns. So teams like this activity and it just spreads throughout your company because teams like it, they share with each other, managers tell each other, oh, this is working well for my team. Let's get this going in other teams. So virtual co-working, that's pretty quickly. A team-led model takes quite a bit more time because it takes preparation and it takes leadership buy-in. So you want leadership buy-in first. So that's the first step. And that usually takes something, in my experience, it takes two to three months to get leadership buy-in. And then implementation takes another two to three months. The same thing takes place with this performance management approach because you need to take your existing performance management approach and tweak tweak it, which is obviously a nuanced issue. So take that and tweak it. The nice thing about the performance management approach is that unlike the team-led model, it can be integrated into different departments at different levels at different times. So you can integrate it into one department, into one team, and can start using it so it does take some time to do that because it's performance management and that's tricky, but you don't have to do as much of a holistic policy shift as with a team led model. Okay, thank you. You're welcome, Natalie. Anyone else? I do have, I have another one. <laughs> yeah, um, please then. Um, just through, I know that this plays a little uh, to train sort of older leadership. Do you find that younger generations take to this much quicker? And oh, absolutely. Yeah, find no question. No question. Okay. Younger leaders, it's, they don't have that status quo bias. So you want to think about that status quo bias, that functional fixedness, they don't have those as much of those problems. They don't have to unlearn you know, the things that they used to learn, that they learn that they, they feel is good. And they're much more comfortable and able to use digital technology, frankly, than older leaders. So from both of those fronts, they don't have as much to unlearn. They don't have as much of their ego writing on being in the office and managing by walking around. They don't have and they can use digital technology much easier. So yes, it's definitely easier with younger leaders. Mm -hmm. 
So Abby asks, is the research at host shows how this model affects the others that teams work with that aren't remote? So working with different teams, departments on site. So you have the experience of Susan Winchester, who shared about it. That's a high tech manufacturing company. You can look up her name, her email, you'll see her face. She works, she's the CHRO of Applied Materials, which is 35,000 company, which has, of course, a number of factory workers who actually produce the semiconductor equipment that applied materials produces. So they definitely found that this works really well for them, partially because it helps them address that proximity bias through an excellence from anywhere culture. So yes, it works very well for these addressing these dynamics and, disp and perceived disparities. Thank you for asking it. Anybody else? Five more seconds to make your voice heard, unmute yourself or put something in the chat. Okay, I guess no more questions. Well, I hope you found this presentation to be valuable and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. Uh, thank you uh, again, Dr. Glad, for taking the time and sharing your expertise. Uh, this presentation was excellent. It gave me a lot to thought, think about as far as moving yeah. forward. So that was really great. And again, we appreciate you coming. Perfect. Um, for the rest of our members, we appreciate y'all who come in and listening today. Um, I will be sending out certificates tomorrow uh, with the credit codes. Um, also be checking our website. I am updating uh, upcoming events for the rest of the year. And for June, we will be back at the country club for lunch with speaker Jody Holland. So I'm excited to hear him as well. Uh, thank you again, everyone. Uh, hope y'all have a great week. I really appreciate it. Bye, guys. Thank you, everyone. It was a great presentation. Good. Thank you. Bye-bye.